question. Are you a person? So you can answer that. Sometimes corporations try to get around that. They think they're people too. So we said yes, but then maybe we should have clarified, are you actually a person? Um, if you are and you want to help a specific candidate, you can give money to the candidate and your um, limit is $2,500. Um, if you have more money to burn, you can, <laughs> one, um, you can, well, if you don't have any more money but your friends have money, you can become a bundler, which means you stop going to your friends and family and collecting money from them to donate to the candidate of your choice. Um, if you do have more money, you have some choices here. You can either give more by donating all you want to a candidate's recount fund um, or to their inaugural committee. You can also give up to $5,000 to their PAC. You can give $2,000 to their compliance fund, which pays lawyers to make sure the candidate follows financing rules. <laughs> um, if you have a bunch more, you can give to a party. Um, you can give to either the Republican Party, the Green Party, the Democratic Party, and you can give up to $30,800 to various Democrats and Republican campaign committees, which in turn also then fund the candidates. Now, if you have a ton more money, what you can do is give to a super PAC. And with a super PAC, you can spend as much money as you want as long as you disclose your identity, unless you, use a you go through a 501c4. Um, super PACs can't collaborate with candidates, but it's no secret who they're supporting. Now, if you don't have a whole heck of a lot of money, if you don't want to help a specific candidate and you want to go up to here, um, it asks you, you know, just how secretive do you want to be about this? And we'll get to that just after I talk about corporations. So, if you're not a person, don't worry, corporations are people too, as decided in Citizens United. Do you? <laughs> and then we ask the question, do you like doing your own dirty work? If you do, you can start your own PAC. Post Citizens United, PACs are the vital records of influence peddling. Outdated, but still good for special occasions. They can't give more than $5,000 to a candidate per election. Um, if you do not like to do your own dirty work, you have to decide how secretive you want to be. If you would like to be pretty secretive, you can get to a 501c, 4, 5, or 6. Um, it's not money laundering because it has its own IRS code. These nonprofits can act like slush funds for their sister super PACs, and they don't have to disclose to their donor. If you don't want to be so secretive, you can give to a super PAC. You can spend as much as you want as long as you disclose your identity. Again, super PACs collaborate with candidates, but it's no secret who they're supporting. If you want to be super secretive, what you can do is form a shell company. This shell company can then make donations to super PACs or 501Cs. You just can't be too obvious about it. So that was my presentation. And oh, this is actually thanks to Mother Jones. And the timeline over there is sourced from NPR. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who is going to talk. Oh, yes. Question on the bundle. Yes. What's to stop somebody from taking their own money and saying, my friend John here is contributing, Mary's contributing. How do they track the bundle? Because it looks like that's the first level where things can get clouds. That I'm not actually sure. That, that's what happened with um, Lou, the comptroller in New York, who is under, under investigation now. I mean, they can track those things if somebody gets them. I mean, like any kind of crime like that, somebody has to be suspicious. But once you start checking it, you can, you can follow the money. Uh, just point of information to his question. Uh, there was a big conviction a couple months ago, and they call it being a straw man. And apparently a land developer here in the Boston area was giving money to friends and then having the friends give it to other candidates. So you can look into that. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who's going to talk about lobbying and the revolving door. Hi, all. Thanks for coming out tonight. So, the revolving door. Uh, I'll be brief because it's a point pretty easily made. There's just a huge conflict of interest going on right now. Government, big business. Hey, Mark. Uh, 
speak up. Yeah, yeah. speak up. Yeah. It's, uh, it needs this, to this be louder. We go like this. So if you can't hear, go like this. There's a huge conflict of interest going on right now between government and big business. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, like I said, I'll be brief because this is a point that's pretty easily made. Uh, a lot of the people going through this revolving door aren't too subtle about it. Um, I know the print on here is kind of small, but some of the figures I've put up here are pretty good examples. Uh, this gentleman here is, might have the record of uh, you know, revolutions through the revolving door. Uh, his name is Michael Taylor. Uh, he started out as an attorney at the FDA before going to work for a law firm that represents uh, the agribusiness company, Monsanto. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I don't, have to, I don't have to elaborate too much. Uh, so he went to work for Monsanto. Uh, for a couple years there, um, returned um, to the FDA, then worked at the Department of Agriculture for a couple years, then returned back to Monsanto as vice president, um, then he went back to the FDA after that, and that's where he's currently at right now. Uh, yeah, it's disgusting. But, um, the financial sector, that's another pretty, pretty bad one. Um, Robert Rubin, a uh, gentleman that was Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, before that, he was uh, executive at Goldman Sachs for many years. Secretary of the Treasury from 95 to 99 before returning to Citigroup um, as an executive. Now, while he was Secretary of Treasury, um, there was a good deal of deregulation going on. That was kind of the buzzword uh, in Washington on Wall Street, dere deregulation. Uh, so in that time, I think it was in 99, maybe right before, right after he left, the Glass-Steagall Act uh, was repealed, which was a law that uh, prevented commercial banks and investment banks from being part of the same institution. Um, so shortly thereafter, he returned to Citigroup, um, which merged um, it was Citibank and another bank. I forget the other bank. Does anybody know? Travelers, uh, what is it? Travelers Insurance. Travelers Insurance. Travelers Insurance, correct. Uh, which was a billion dollar mer uh, merger. You know, obviously, he was handsomely compensated for that. Um, Hank Paulson, another guy, Goldman Sachs, CEO, moves to government service, Secretary of Treasury. Uh, yeah, and I mean, it's, it's interesting when you, you hear these people interviewed about. Uh, pot any potential conflict of interest, the answer they give is generally the same. It's, you know, they played by the rules. They, they didn't break any rules in doing this. And that, to me, really is uh, the biggest problem, is that this is institutionalized, that uh, they aren't breaking rules. Uh, though it seems you know, pretty evident that this is not right. Uh, I mean, how can you have trust and a guy that's you know, running one of the biggest agribusiness companies in the world and then you know, telling you that what they're making is okay, everything they're doing is okay, when he's, you know, he's, he's the guy that's supposed to be regulating us. He's supposed to be uh, our regulator, the people's regulator. But you know, it's, it's just so, you know, it's obvious. It's obvious that it's a, it's a conflict of interest. That's all it is. That's all it comes down to. Um, so, and um, yeah, I mean, the examples, if you just type in revolving door, I found this out uh, a couple of days ago. If you just type in revolving door, examples abound. Uh, there's just. Well, Arthur has some examples, I'll bet. Maybe Arthur can give us an example. Well, whatever we can. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's all I really have to say. This is, this to me is actually probably the biggest problem. Uh, campaign contributions, the size of them, that's problematic. You know, Citizens United, corporate personhood, that's problematic. But, you know, this, this just can't happen. This isn't, it's clearly not right. We're not, we're not being represented. This is, yeah. it makes me go crazy sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Now, <laughs> um, did you have any questions? Uh,
in information architecture, flow, system flow, uh, valuation of change, and um, I get consulting money for this. I have sworn not to earn more than a certain amount of money, okay? It's a lot less than, than it's, it's, I mean, I, I, I think the most I ever earned in my entire life was like $200,000 a year. And since then, it's been going down, down, down because I do all my community work. <laughs> but I have sworn never to take money from the, pro from the public sector because if I do, then I am bought by that public sector, okay? When I do my private work, I don't do anything that impacts, um, like when I, do my, when I have my clients that pay me to do, uh, for example, it'll be change analysis. All right, so when I look at change analysis and I say, gee, you know, you could streamline this. Well, I won't participate in that, and I've made this declaration. You look at my website where my declarations are relative to ownership of data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have sworn certain principles on how to do change without destroying jobs, for example, all right? See, these people don't swear to anything. They swear to capitalism. They swear, they swear to ruthless capitalism, in a sense. And so until we have principles by which we live by, I'm getting into it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, I don't know what the question is. With <laughs> <laughs> the one other question, I saw someone raising their hand. Yes. Yeah. Um, just, just on that point, real quick, I think I think that there used to be either a um, implicit or, or, or a basic idea that if you worked in the government sector in a certain field, that there was a time that you had to take a rest before you went into the industry yeah. that you were either representing or, or advocating for. I, I don't think it was ever really a law, but I think it was there was a, more, a better attitude about what was right and what was wrong. And now, now, do you know if that was changed? I, I don't think it really ever changed because they went around it and they double dipped. There's a yeah, whole way I mean, of getting around it. Yeah, but I, but I think that there used to be more of an onus. There used to be more of a um, yeah. people Jamie would look unfavorable about it. That they were more aware of it, or, or it just was perceived to be more of a bad thing. My question was: You had uh, Dick Cheney's up there, and I understand that he. While he was vice president advocating for the war and while the war was going on, he was, through a, a what he called a blind trust, still trading and, and, and profiting from Halliburton income from when he was uh, vice president and president of Halliburton because he got paid, he, he was compensated with stock. And so his blind trust was supposed to be managed in the stock. And his conversation during this whole period was he didn't know anything about it because he wasn't doing it. You know the whole trust, the blind trust thing. He had nothing to do with what was happening, but he said that if it turned out that he made profit through Halliburton because of war, and obviously Halliburton turned into a very profitable, you know, corporation because of it, he said he would donate that money to charity. I don't know. I mean, this is something he said, and I don't know if that was ever followed up on. If anyone knows if that happened, or if anyone has heard anything like that. Here, might as well take this. Good evening, everybody. I'm State Senator Jamie Eldridge, and thank you very much for having me. Just to answer that question, there, there's no ban for federal legislators, for congressmen and women or U.S. senators from going right into an industry after they've retired. But um, for state, the state legislature, there's a one-year ban from, from becoming a lobbyist. So there, there are some things out there, but I agree there needs to be more. And anyone who followed the, the casino debate, there was the uh, amendment to create a five-year cooling off period for legislators before they went to work for a casino. That was the amendment that I filed. 
and it, it got watered down to one year, but it is possible to create some change here, but it does take a lot of grassroots organizing and advocacy. So there never was any rural for federal? No, there isn't. Nope. I just want to let everybody know that Jamie Eldridge was the first and I guess only uh, legislator in the history of Massachusetts who actually got elected on a campaign, a public financing of campaigns. And our short-lived, I guess we had a very short-lived bill. When we like something, it occupies us and we use it. I was just going to say one thing. As a business consultant, one year, five years is nothing. You just sit around, you figure out your strategies, you make your relationships, and you come back in, and you get it then. Okay, so all of that cooling off, you really should, if you're going to work for the public, as a public representative, you should swear off for infinitely to get profit from the regulations that you introduce and you design. Yeah, to answer your question, uh, there are, I think it depends on the agency, uh, like Jamie had mentioned, uh, in the legislature, the rules might be a little bit different uh, than, say, like the SEC, for example, where there are actually rules um, that say, like, you know, uh, a person can't go to work for a private company for, like, the same issue that they had been, um, you know, working on while at the SEC. Um, it seems to me there's a lot of ways to get around that. Um, and there isn't, I don't think there's any time period that you have to wait as long as you file the necessary paperwork. You can go to work. Uh, I was reading about guys that were leaving the SEC and going to work for another company two days later. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm starting to see a lot of hands come up. I know people have a lot to say yeah. about these issues. Um, there are a couple more people on the program for tonight. And then um, the plan is to do some breakout group discussions so that everybody's voice can be heard on these issues. So um, I'm going to ask if, uh, if we can keep the sort of back and forth for the next little bit um, to a minimum, and then there will be an opportunity for everybody to speak on these issues um, moving forward. So thanks. Thanks. So uh, I just want to say that I, you have convinced me about the, cam uh, the revolving door being perhaps the most important thing, and I think that we should all think about that and think about working on that. So how many people have heard of Citizens United? Ah, wow, okay. So uh, I just wanted to go through the bare bones of it, and then we're going to have our speaker, Arthur McEwen, who is from Dollars and Cents and a 30-year uh, economics professor of, uh, at UMass Boston is going to explain it at a much higher level. So um, the, campaign, uh, the Citizens United case was brought uh, as a request to the court for an injunction against the ruling of the McCain-Feingold, uh, which is called the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act also. And uh, I guess in the beginning it was perhaps um, not upheld, but he took it to the Supreme Court. I'm not sure about that. But when he took it to the Supreme Court, they ended up uh, doing a very strange thing. But first, let me tell you what the, can uh, the McCain Feingold bill said in it. Uh, it, it pertains to uh, corporations and unions. Pro this may not be all of it, but this particular section uh, per pertains to corporations, either profit or nonprofit corporations and unions. Uh, who may use their general treasury funds for electioneering, which is meaning a speech which specifically advocates for or against a specifically named uh, candidate. Uh, and it was prohibited within 60 days of a general election and 30 days of a primary. So in other words, it was allowed except for those restrictions. And uh, then also if it, it's, um, wait a minute, oh yeah. And this would be only if it were on a kind of medium, a broadcast medium, that reached a wide range of people, such as uh, on television, the presumption is it would reach at least 50,000 people. And the Citizens United video was going to be shown on a cable TV. So they said it was rather small, and they also, uh, and the audience was small, but they were going to advertise it on the regular broadcast TV to say that it was, was out there and say it was about Hillary. So um, they, also, they also wanted to uh, have an injunction on the basis of them being a nonprofit organization as opposed to a profit corporation. So the 
Supreme Court looked at this and they decided that they could not they could not uphold this on narrow grounds. The narrow grounds would be that they were a nonprofit. They didn't feel they could uphold it on that basis. And they didn't feel that they could uphold it on the basis of it being a small broadcast medium because of the ads on TV. But what they decided to do was very strange. They wanted, they were concerned about this, the free speech issue, the, the um, uh, First Amendment rights, which had been brought up in previous cases uh, over time, and it had been ruled in various ways. In one of the early cases, it was uh, approved that the, the corporations had the right to speak free speech. But in a couple of other cases, McConnell and Austin, uh, it, was, it was decided that they had limitation on their speech. So what they did was they decided not to do what Citizens United had asked them to do, but to relook at the whole case and bring it in on a very foundational level and look at, and look at the issue. Uh, and what they did was they overturned these two rulings. Uh, sorry, I have to turn the page. Um, Austin and, and McConnell, uh, Austin was in 1990, and it, the holding was that the political speech could be banned based on the speaker's corporate identity. And the reason was to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. And also there was another big concern. It had to do with the uh, corporation's treasuries not being correlated with the desire of the people and would be unfairly used to, um, to influence election outcomes. And the corporations didn't have a correlation necessarily with the people in the corporations or their shareholders, not to mention the people of the country. So for that reason, Austin said that it was possible to limit the use of these funds. Uh, however, it was considered to be narrowly tailored, meaning that if you, have a, if you have the capacity to allow for something by, by creating a way it can be done that is less disruptive, then you can do it that way. So it was narrowly tailored in this, in this sense. Uh, because, um, wait a minute, I have to read this. Uh, because it allowed corporations to make expenditures through separate segregated funds. In other words, the corporation didn't give it directly from their general treasury, but it, it made a pact, and the pact was donated to by individuals, and all of the individuals agreed with the speech, and they agreed with the, the basic concept behind the organization. They knew where they were coming from and they gave their money to the organization and so they were uh, supporting it. So that was the way out. They were allowed to use a PAC which was not from their general treasury but they were allowed to uh, you know, get donations from people who agreed with that, that speech and then they were allowed to have unlimited uh, speech on that issue. So uh, that that was the decision of the Supreme Court. However, there were several of the justices who disagreed with him, primarily Justice Stevens. And he was uh, concurred uh, in this with uh, Sotomayor, Breyer, and Ginsburg. And he wrote, he was so upset about this, in fact, that he wrote a 90-page dissent. There, <laughs> there, the first two, I have copied it in the format that I make it. it it's a two-pager. His whole sort of um, layout of his case takes two pages, and I have, I have it here, and I'm going to pass it around, and anyone who wants to take the two-page summary can take it. It's really very wonderful because he's so passionate and he's so upset. Uh, but I'm just going to read you uh, just a very short bit of why, what he said, and uh, he said a lot more than this, but I think this is really, you know, important. It says, um, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act could have used those assets. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I think I better read the whole thing. Citizens United is a wealthy nonprofit corporation that runs a political action committee, PAC. So in other words, they have their treasury, but they also had a PAC. It could have used the PAC, but it, it just didn't want to. Uh, it could have used those ads, assets to televise and promote Hillary, the movie wherever and when, whenever it wanted to. It also could have spent unrestricted sums to broadcast Hillary 
at any time other than the 30 days before the primary election. So they had a lot of other ways they could have done it. And nevertheless, it was felt by the majority of the Supreme Court that it was necessary to overturn these two, uh, Austin and McConnell. So I'm going to leave it at that, but that's just a little bit of background. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Arthur McEwen, who uh, is, uh, as I said, he's a writer and uh, also writes online for Dollars and Cents, and he's going to take it from there. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about uh, this issue of corporate personhood. First, however, I, I want to comment on some of the things that have been said about the history of finance regulations in elections. In particular, quite accurately, the people that were describing it said how both corporations and unions are prohibited or allowed to do various things. The problem with that is it somehow portrays that corporations and unions are equally balanced somehow. And let me just give you a few a few figures here that, that both illustrate the issue of corporate of finance, uh, of elections and uh, of legislative activity and regulation, but also deal with this uh, union and corporation issue. Between 2000 and 2010, lobbying expenditures grew from 1.6 billion dollars to 3.5 billion dollars, about four times as fast as inflation. The leading business sectors have been finance, insurance, insurance and real estate on the one hand, and healthcare, that is the pharmaceuticals and the hospitals and so on, on the other. Each of these two sectors spent $4.6 billion on lobbying in the 1998 to 2010 period. In 2010, healthcare firms spent $522 million on lobbying and used 3,220 lobbyists while the insurance and real estate group spent $475 million and used 2,565 lobbyists. Yeah. The, uh, although labor unions are often lumped together with businesses spending large amounts of money for political influence, union lobbying expenditures are dwarfed by business lobbying. In the entire 1998-2010 period, unions spent 465 million, not much compared to the billions that were spent. In other words, less than either of those sectors I mentioned spent in one year. A further contrast to the role of unions, in 2010, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce spent 132 million on lobbying, almost three times as much as organized labor. And so this myth that somehow unions and business are being treated equally, it, it, it doesn't fly. I mean, there are other ways in which unions play direct roles by giving to candidates and so on in the same way business does. Now, one of the things that those figures illustrate for you is that before the Citizens United case, indeed, as the timeline illustrates as well, the issue of money in politics is nothing new. Uh, Citizens United is something to get excited about, to be sure, but it's not a game changer. Uh, the game has been played and will continue to be played for quite a while in a, a similar manner. Nonetheless, there are particular points in what I've referred to as a game, uh, in this process by which money influences politics, uh, that do need some attention. And one of these is the issue of corporate personhood. Now, to to get it to get at that, you got to remember what a corporation is. A, a corporation. The clue to what a corporation is is what it's called in England. That is, in this country, we say Ford Motor Company Corporation. In the United Kingdom, they refer to Ford Motor Company Limited. And the reason they do that is because the defining feature of corporations is what's called limited liability. That is, if I put, if I buy some Ford, I don't buy a lot of stock, but, but if I were to buy stock in Ford Motor Company, I'd be an owner of the company, a small owner, but an owner nonetheless. 
or if I were a big owner, it would be the same. What this means that is if Ford Motor, Com Motor Company would go broke, as it almost did, I could lose my investment, but I couldn't lose more than that. My liability would be limited to what I put into the company. However, if I'm a private individual and I'm not incorporated and I'm running a business making automobiles in my garage and I incur debts, then people can come after my house, my other assets, whatever. But by taking part in this corporation, my liability is limited to what I invested in the corporation. They can't come after my other assets. Now, that's terribly important for the development of large firms because large firms depend on having lots of people who don't know each other invest in them. Now, you know, I have a problem loaning mother money to my brother. He'll pay me back, but it's still a problem. Uh, <laughs> that, that actually the money flows the other way around if it flows at all. But you're not going to put money into an anonymous corporation. People you don't know are going to be using your money if they screw up and you can lose everything you have, not just what you put into that firm. So limited liability is terribly important for the development of large firms. And that with the technological and organizational changes that came into importance in the latter part of the 19th century, corporate, the corporate form became very important in both in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Corporations had existed earlier. They were called joint stock companies, particularly firms like the Hudson Bay Company, the East Indian Company, and, and so on, were engaged in international trading. Uh, the corporate form, it wasn't called the corporate form, as I said, it was called the joint stock company, was quite important for being able to bring together these large amounts of money to do things on a big scale. But it really became important and a common factor in the latter part of the, uh, of the 19th century. And that's when this issue of corporate personhood started to become an issue. Now, it was based, interestingly, on the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, if you remember, was one of the amendments that was passed after the Civil War. And the part of it that's most relevant was designed quite specifically to assure the rights, the so-called equal protection, is the equal protection clause, of African Americans. And the, the, the 14th Amendment says that you, no state can pass a law that doesn't treat everybody equally. Now, these, that concept has an earlier history. If you look at the Fifth Amendment, uh, which we all think of as the right not to incriminate yourself, it also includes an equal protection part. But the 14th Amendment, which was solidifying this for African Americans, and everybody knew it at the time. However, However, corporations had already been, were already established with these legal rights that made them people in a legal sense. Nobody thought they were people in a, in a real sense, in a flesh and blood sense, but they had the right to contract like people did. They had the right to sue and be sued in the same way as people. This was important for their ability to do business on a grand scale. So, when various local authorities, towns, states, tried to treat corporations differently than local industry, for think of it in terms of Walmart wanting to come into your small town in western Massachusetts and people don't want them, or to take a more appropriate and more immediate example, suppose you, they want to build a casino uh, in, your, in your town. Uh, well, you can't pass a law that says, no, no, no outside corporations can do this because they're people and they have to be treated equally. The courts ruled in a series of cases starting in the latter part of the 19th century. So they used, in other words, this provision in the 14th Amendment that was generally seen to be a provision to protect the rights of African Americans, to protect the rights of corporations. Now, the interesting thing is that in all these decisions, 
nobody pretends that corporations really are just like people. I mean, there's signs some, you know, that, that some people in the Occupy movement have held up. You know, I, I believe the corporations are people when Texas ex executes one, right? I mean, you know, that's perfectly appropriate. I mean, corporations, I mean, you know, with all the progress on marriage laws, at least corporations can't get married, right? Uh, that, and nobody, nobody's even trying that one. Now, now, it's called, very good, very good. But, but there, the point is that corporate personhood is not an absolute thing. It's not something that says, oh, well, they have to be treated just like people, and people have to be treated just like corporations. That's not what happens. What happens is that argument is used and gets judgments about when it can be applied and when it can't. I mean, just think, if corporations are people, then we people, who are flesh and blood people, might have all the rights of corporations. For example, for example, if you run a corporation and your people have to drive around to do their job, the cost of the driving around, business expense, right? If you get yourself to work in your car, or for that matter, if you take the T, is that a business expense? No. no. Only, only if you're self-employed. No, no, but that's right. No, no, but, but if you're self-employed, you're a business, and you can take it. But what do I sell? I sell my labor power. But I can't take that as a deduction. I can't take it as a deduction. Also, look at taxes. The corporate tax system is totally different from the individual tax system. And it can be manipulated and structured in ways probably easier than the personal tax. Although, if you're rich, you can play with personal tax, too. But they're not the same, is the point. We're, they're not treated like people. They are treated as a special category of people. Maybe that's the answer. They're treated as rich people uh, <laughs> the, the, in, in the whole thing. But, but the, that, so, so once you say that corporations are people, the game's far from over. The game's far from over. There's still lots of decisions to be made about what kind of people. Now, what's happened, in other words, is this idea of corporate personhood has been used as a lever. It's been used as a lever to get certain things, like this idea of free speech for corporations. That uh, Now, and if we didn't have personhood, that issue would come up in other ways. In fact, it already has come up in other ways. For example, one of the arguments for allowing the uh, corporate contributions is not their personhood position, but the argument that why should people, when they group together, give up any of their rights. If, I, if you and I as individuals can ha exercise free speech, we get together and call it a corporation, why can't we still exercise free speech? Well, there are reasons, but I mean, that argument has also existed. In other words, there are lots of other arguments. The revolving door issue is important. Campaign contributions are important. There are a lot of different th ways in which rich and powerful people can get what they want. We have to confront each one of these. We have to confront corporate personhood as a lever. We have to confront the revolving door as well. I disagree with one of the speakers that the revolving door is the key. I mean, it is important. I mean, I, no, I'm not, I don't mean that very critically. There are a lot of things like that. And the fundamental question for me, for me the fundamental question is how is it? How is it that this insignificantly small group of people, and this is what's been so successful about the Occupy movement. This 1%, this insignificantly small group of people can get the government to do what it wants in spite of the fact that in a formal sense, we live in a democracy. That is to say, it's got all its problems. It's got all its problems, but we have the right to vote. We have, in any relative sense, free speech, the freedom to organize, and, you know, I mean, I'm not saying there are all sorts of problems. I'm not, I'm not saying it's, it's all that great. But how is it that this insignificant minority can get the government to do what it wants on such a regular basis? And for me, the answers to that are partly 
they, once you have money, you can influence politics. We've been talking about that. And that's important. And we should do all the things that have been talked about here this evening and which flow from what we've been talking about to restrain, control, limit that use of money in politics. The revolving door, the campaign contributions and so on are all important. But that's not the whole story. That's one step. One of the, the second, what I find the most interesting from a purely abstract intellectual point of view, is how that 1% can get so many people to believe that their interests are the same as that 1%. That's what's really amazing, that so many people believe that. Now, there are a lot of ways you can figure that out. The, the um, large, the rich individuals directly and through foundations, for example, have been directing the way schools are so-called reformed in this country. Now, it's not that they're always bad, but what is the message of the school reform movement today? The school reform movement's message is the problem is bureaucracy and the problem is unions. Let's privatize education and make it small, separate units that go on. Well, there's no empirical foundation for thinking any of these, th these other kinds of schools are better on average. The problem with the schools is poverty. The problem is that school kids come to sc sick, school sick and hungry, and they come out of families that are so poor that they cannot provide those kids with the background. That it's, you know, but no, no. The rich have told us, the Gates Foundation, the Broad Foundation, and so on have told us that the problem is bureaucracy and unions. You notice how in Brookline and, Union, Brookline and Newton, the schools are really terrible, right? Because they have unions. We all know that. And, <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, that, uh, and then there's the newspapers. Now, why is it that when we have freedom of the press, and we do by any standard, why is it that we have the media takes on the interests of, of, the, uh, of the very wealthy. Well, I, I want to read you my favorite quote of the year. Um, that uh, I got it here someplace. Yeah. Okay. This, this statement was made by the man who was the uh, chief executive officer of the New York Times man named uh, Russ Lewis, and it was 19, 2002, and he was commenting on why it was that the newspapers, the Times and others, gave so little attention to the development of the Enron scandal. Remember Enron? Maybe you forget Enron, which is probably a good thing. And uh, he, he posed the question, he said, so why is it? Why is it so long? He said, what people have to understand, he said, historically, historically, the press's ability to act as a check on the actions of government has been helped by the fact that the two institutions are constitutionally separated, organizationally and financially. The press does not depend on government officials, either for its standing or its resources, but it has a much more intricate relationship with big business. Today's news media are themselves frequently part of large, often global corporations dependent on advertising revenue that increasingly comes from other large corporations. As public companies themselves, the news media are under the same kind of pressure to create shareholder value by reducing costs and increasing earnings, as are other public companies. And they face numerous potential conflicts of interest as they grow larger and more diversified. The First Amendment makes it difficult for government to impede or financially threaten the work of the press but no such constitutional provision applies to the intersection of the press and big business. It is both impractical and unrealistic to expect news media companies, including newspaper firms, to retreat from their positions as increasingly large, diversified business enterprises. To do so would not only undermine their financial strength, it would also deprive them and their staff of the resources needed to perform their increasingly difficult and demanding jobs. When the head of the New York Times tells us that, what else is there to say? I, that it goes on. The, uh, but 
that's what this whole ideology thing is what I find most interesting. And but there's another more fundamental underlying problem. And that is in the organization of our economy, we are dependent on the firms, corporations and other non-corporate forms of, of firms to make the investments and create the jobs that we all need. Now, at least we think that. So when they tell us, you've got to cut our taxes so we can do business more, you've got to drop the regulations so we can do business more effectively, people accept that. Politicians, who may be quite decent people, they don't want to be unemployed, and they'll be unemployed, they think, if they don't do what business is asking. And there is a certain truth in it. That is, if business isn't profitable, nobody's going to make the investment. So if you take away all the profitability, you're not going to get the investment in your jobs. But there's a far cry between a partial truth and the whole truth. And there's a partial, big difference between making, having something that is profitable and something that is very profitable. But as long as we have this belief that we are so dependent on business and have to do what they say, then we are in trouble. Just to give you one example of this, you may have noticed, I expect you did, how few prosecutions there have been as a result of the financial crisis. Okay? Now, part of the reason, there are a lot of reasons for that, I won't go into them, but the Justice Department has followed a practice in some of these cases, of allowing firms to promise they won't do it anymore <laughs> and correct it themselves. And the justification they offer for this is that, look, if we prosecute these people, and I could read you the quote now, but I, 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 it's very clear. If we prosecute these people, just top corporate leaders, just think of all the people who'd lose their jobs. Innocent people would lose their jobs. So we can't prosecute them. Now, if you think about that for a minute, you can excuse any crime, right? Any crime. Now, just one second. The, the, the lesson of all this is not that the corporate personhood isn't important. It is very important. The revolving door is very important. But we're confronting a large set of things that create the problems that we're facing. And we've got to think of it that way, even while we focus our actions on particular problems that are very important. Thank you very much. What is next? Laura, we're going to do some... So now I'd just like to bring Jamie up. He has a handout for everybody and then also is going to talk about some of the solutions that he's proposing in the State House. Also, for those of you who didn't get a copy of the Justice Stevens uh, two pages, just put your email on this paper, and I'll send it to you. Okay. So what's happening next is we're going to be doing breakout sessions to discuss and come up with ideas for next action. Is that right? For yes. steps that we can take. Also, we're preparing for a summit on the 21st, after the day after the Occupy the Courts. We're going to occupy the federal courts. So we've got some things planned, and uh, so stick around because we want to uh, break out into discussion groups so things can learn more, learn what their neighbors think, and we can come together with um, a number of consensus. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm State Senator Jamie Eldridge, and again, thanks very much for inviting me. And I will be brief. I'm going to speak for about five to six minutes. Um, I'm I'm here because I think mostly because I serve as the, the lead sponsor on Senate 7, 772, the resolution calling on our congressional delegation to support a constitutional amendment to amend amend the Constitution to state that the Bill of Rights and the Constitution are are for persons and not for corporations. So this is a, a national effort that's going on by groups like Free Speech for People, Move to Amend, I know a number of other organizations that are present here. This is the, the state effort to do this, so I'd really welcome your support to get behind this. So just to, to back up a little bit, th this is sort of the issue of campaign finance reform has been something that's been a big passion of mine since I was first elected. And, and as I was introduced earlier, I'm the, the, the first, and as the Boston Globe said, last clean elections candidate elected in Massachusetts. And what that meant was that I was publicly financed, so I didn't have to raise any money except for a very small number of donations of less than $100. The rest of my funding was publicly funded. I was successful in the race, and then the following summer, 
the legislature and Governor Romney repealed the law. So that's why I'm the first and last clean elections candidate in Massachusetts. So I just want to give three quick examples of, of what we're up against. And when I say we, I'm, I'm, just, I'm ascribing myself as a progressive Democrat. There are a group of progressive Democrats in the legislature that are fighting a lot of these battles. And the point there is that not all Democrats in the legislature are the same. And the three, the three issue examples, the bottle bill. Bottle bill, overwhelming public support to put five cent deposit on a bottle of water on juices. Uh, over 70% of the public supports it in the most recent poll. Why hasn't it passed? It's basically because, in my opinion, because you have a couple of beverage companies like Ocean Spray and Polar Beverage in Massachusetts. You have the alcohol beverage community, you know, liquor stores and such, that put a lot of money into elections, uh, whether through PACs or through the owners of these, of these companies or these, these stores, that influence legislators to be fearful to support this. And that's why the bottle bill hasn't been updated since 1982. Uh, corporate tax cut of transparency. There's been a, a lot of stories in the papers over the past couple of years of corporations that accept tax breaks with a promise to create jobs. They turn around and not only don't create the jobs, but they're actually sending jobs in Massachusetts overseas. And they're keeping the tax break. So there is an effort to put some enforcement into these provisions to say that if a company is going to accept a tax, tax break with a promise of creating jobs, that they have to honor that promise. And if they don't, the state can take back that tax dollar money and spend it for other purposes. Uh, third example is health care. Um, I am a supporter of universal single payer health care. Health care is a right. Uh, I figure that I have, might have a lot of support here. <laughs> Why can't we break through? Well, a big part of it is that there are a lot of healthcare executives in Massachusetts. There are a lot of corporate lobbyists who represent them that spend a lot of money to legislators uh, and statewide elected officials to defeat any, even any discussion of single payer healthcare. And as an example, the, the hearing on single payer healthcare, uh, which I was proud to file this year, was heard four days before Christmas. So you have a whole year's worth of hearings, and it's, it's held just a few days before Christmas when the media is not paying attention, very little people are able to make it to testify on the bill. So that's, an exi that's an, a challenge, is, as I know a lot of the previous speakers have already talked about, that the, the problem of money in politics is nothing new. It's, it's, it's been there for a long time. It's creating a barrier to progress in a number of areas. So the Citizens United decision is of great concern for, for two major reasons. It's suddenly... It's not just the healthcare executives or their lobbyists or beverage companies being able to create a PAC or have their executives spend money. It's now the corporation themselves. And the fear is that if one of these companies exists in a legislator's district or anywhere in the state, that company can spend a lot of money and drown out the voices not only of ordinary citizens, but, but of an average legislator's uh, stands on certain, certain of these issues. So that's, so that's the concern. The other part is the chilling, the chilling effect is that with the knowledge that a company could spend literally millions of dollars in a race, or in a legislative race, probably you know $100,000, is the chilling effect is that will have a, an effect on legislators to say, well, you know, I care a lot about the bottle bill, but this company is in my district. Maybe, maybe I won't support it. Maybe, I, maybe I'll sort of ease off on that. Or you know, I know that health care should be a right in this state, but I know that uh, Fallon Health Insurance in the Worcester area they're not going to be pleased with my position, so maybe I won't support that. And it has a chilling effect on the, on the content and discussion of issues and the ability to get those things passed by legislators. So there's a real serious concern about that. And, and I would just say it's not just about you know, congressional races, presidential. It's not even just about state legislative races. It's also about local races. Think of, think of a, a selectman uh, position or a city council race. A, a developer looks to propose a major development in a neighborhood. If that city council or that selectman opposes that project, there is a greater likelihood, post Citizens United, for that developer, say, to spend $10,000 and take out an ad in the paper or even do an ad on community access TV that criticizes or attacks that candidate. And the reality is that most local officials raise very little money. It would be very difficult for them to even raise that much amount of money to, pr to provide that opposing point of view. So that's why there's a lot of concern from a number of legislators about this issue, but quite honestly, there's really not, not that much support for it. I mentioned that the single-payer health care bill just had a hearing before Christmas. Well, what bill hasn't even had a hearing is the hearing uh, for this resolution that a group of us filed before the Judiciary Committee. So 
the handout that I that I gave you, which is a summary not only of the Senate 70, 772, but a couple other bills that a group of us are working on, is we're just trying to get a hearing on this bill, uh, this resolution, Senate 772. Again, it's just a resolution, doesn't, doesn't have any uh, uh, legal effect other than taking a stand for Massachusetts to call on our congressional delegation to support a constitutional amendment. Sadly, uh, not a single congressman or woman or U.S. senator supports the constitutional amendment in Massachusetts. I know we have a, a lot of wonderful progressive Democrat congressmen uh, and women in Massachusetts, but none of them support a constitutional amendment. They support smaller acts like the Disclosed Act, but none of them support a constitutional amendment. So there's a lot of work to do, and I would just ask you to contact your congressmen and women, your U.S. senators, your state legislators to get behind this resolution and, and let's try to pass this bill this session. Thank you. Okay, so on the 20th and 21st, we're going to try to put on this big event called the Rally and Summit to Unite Citizens for Democracy. And on the 20th, what we would like to do is have a rally where we have a bunch of speakers, some educational materials, maybe some exhibits, and a lot of like entertainment. We're planning a skit um, to really educate and build awareness about this issue in the public so that we can get people motivated to maybe act on some of these bills like 772. Um, and so we're going to do that on the Friday. And then on Sunday, what we're going to do is we're going to have a summit where we actually sit down and kind of talk about these issues. And if any of you went to the summit in October, it will hopefully be much like that, except more focused on this issue. Um, so we're going to break out into breakout groups right now. And the breakout groups are going to be, um, if you would like to discuss public financing, um, that will be one group. And we'll probably have that back there with Jules, because he is kind of somewhat an expert on that. Um, um, we'll have another one on awareness building, and maybe we can do that sort of like in the center here. Um, and then we'll have another one on corporate personhood, which maybe we should do up here with Arthur. Um, and then PACs, we can put over here in this corner if you want to talk about PACs. And lobbying, we can do that over here where Mark was presenting with that information as well. Does anybody else have any other ideas of things that you would like to break out on? Yes, we hope so, yes. We um, have a couple of locations that we're working on and we are gonna be announcing those on the 11th, but the dates are set, so. Does everybody know the Occupy Boston website? The Occupy Boston website is occupyboston.org. If you go to the front page of the website, there's a calendar on the right hand side, which should have all of the information about when events are being held, where they're being held, um, and for the most part, they are open to the public. Um, so invite your friends. Um, um, so as you're thinking about this in the open discussion,